center. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> I, that was actually my part. I wanted to say that we are recording this uh, meeting before I started my introduction to Ragnar, but now we are having this in between. So anyway, I was saying that Ragnar Lofstedt uh, is professor at King's College London, and he's also the director of the Risk Communication Challenge course for continuing education professionals and um, where he just talked about his experience with teaching in the COVID-19 pandemic. And Ragnar, he has sort of a BA and MA degrees from uh, University of California and Clark University. He has completed his PhD also at Clark University, where he met Audrin Renn and Ragnar, you know, we are uh, two we are kindred spirits. We've got the same PhD advisor. Audrin Wren uh, is our PhD advisor. And Ragnar, he also went on to the IASA, to the Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, and also the University of Surrey, where you've been a lecturer before you joined King's in 2002. And um, I'm also delighted to work with Ragnar and he is sort of his research themes and topics are mainly uh, risk communication uh, with regards to chemical and food and environmental safety, but also pharmaceuticals and also the role of transparency in policymaking in a post trust post a uh, truth society, and I find that very intriguing, that post-trust world concept. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Ragnar, and Ragnar is going to present us uh, his inside view on Sweden's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic on the first wave. Thank you, Ragnar. Thank you very much, Pia. <clears throat> it's great to be here today. I'm sorry we can't do face-to-face, -face, but we have a pandemic in Germany's middle of fourth wave. So this talk today on Sweden's handling of the COVID-19 pandemic first wave is based on four co-written period articles on the topic. And you can get those, they, I mean, they're public accessible or now, they're all published in Journal Risk Research. If you, and if you find this topic fascinating and you can't find my articles, get back to me, just drop me an email, just Google me and I'll send you the articles. A, B, this talk is also based on an excellent book by Johan Underberg, who's a journalist and is based in Stockholm. And it's called Flocken, it's written in Swedish, and it's Flocken means the herd. And that'll be translated into English in April 2022. It's also based on me living in Sweden during the first pandemic. I was in London initially in March 2020, but uh, by the 19th of March, uh, I was getting, you know, I was very unhappy because we were running on a toilet, toilet paper in London. I, I have no idea how it was in Germany or in the United States, wherever you're from. But in, the U in London, people were queuing outside Tesco's at 6 a.m. in the morning to buy toilet roll. And I told my loving wife and my two daughters, I said, basically, that's it. I had enough of this stuff. You know, I'm not going to be, I'm not, I don't want to be here and people queuing up a toilet roll at six in the morning. So I told, told them I'm off. I'm going to Sweden. I'm going to my trees. I have 347 hectares of forest in Småland in southern Sweden. I said, that's it, I'm going to Sweden. I'm gonna look after my trees for a few months until the world comes back to normal. So little did I know, I didn't go for two months. I went for more like six months. So I was in Sweden during the first wave. So it's also a bit of a personal experience here. So get some background here to you now. So following China admitting that COVID-19 spread from person to person on the 20th of January, 2020, the chief epidemiologist at the Swedish Public Health Agency, Dr. Anders Tignell, considered the risk of COVID spreading from China to Sweden as low, like the rest of Europe. Tignell was not basically an outlier here. No one really thought in Europe that we would have COVID-19 coming from China to Europe because there's been a number of different bugs in Asia that did not make it to the European continent. And Tignell was pretty convinced that it's not gonna happen this time around. On the 24th of January, Tignell repeated this and saying that the Swedes you don't have to be worried about COVID-19. And the first case of COVID-19 in Sweden was diagnosed on the 30th of January when a woman had been in China, in Wuhan, and gone back to the city of Yunshiping. And she was very, you know, responsible, said she had the symptoms, she self-isolated. She took the swab, sent the swab into the 
central agency, and yes, she had it, and she basically recovered. On the 3rd of February, the Swedish Public Health Agency senior leadership team decided, hmm, maybe we should be worried. Let's form a crisis leadership organization within the agency on COVID-19. And Pia, let me know if I speak too fast, because I can't speak fast, because I love speaking about risk issues, and I have a very much of a Swedish-American sing-songy accent, which some people have a hard, hard, hard time to follow. On the 2nd of March, the Public Health Agency holds a press conference and announces that in the worst case scenario, that 15,000 Swedes will become ill with COVID-19. On the 11th of March, the government, following advice from the agency, decides to halt colleges implement virtual teaching rather than face-to-face. -face. Schools remain open, which is also very, very interesting. And think, considering the fact that on the 9th of March, you had the Swedish version of Eurovision contest, it's basically the shortlist Eurovision. You had some 30,000 people coming together at a very crowded Friends Arena in Solna outside Stockholm. So even just two days beforehand, life was very, very much normal in terms of crowds. Same week, the agency encourages that 70 plus, in 70 year and older individuals should shield and that people should stop visiting old people's homes. In these early stages, there's no test and trace scheme in place. Sweden, like most other countries, have a chronic shortage of kit. Finland, I know, had kit. I have no idea about Germany. But Sweden, like the UK, had not enough kit to test and trace. They just didn't, they couldn't do it. They didn't have the capacity at all to do it. So the Swedish strategy was to follow the data, evidence, and the science. Tignell was quoted in the press saying, the world had, has gone crazy following lockdowns being announced in Italy and Spain and school closures in a number of European countries, including Sweden's neighbors, Denmark and Norway, where the politicians in Denmark and Norway went against advice from the public health agency. In those countries, both in Denmark and Norway, said, don't close the school, the schools. Yet the politicians said, we're closing the schools. We had the same thing happening in Sweden where, where the agency said, don't close the schools. And in, in this case in Sweden, the politicians decided to listen to the agency officials and decided not to close the schools. And one of the reasons for that is that the prime minister at the time, Stefan Stif Levin, he's basically, his background is a trade union background from Northern Sweden. And he, didn't, he doesn't like to have conflict, doesn't, doesn't like speaking publicly. And he decided basically, hang on, Tignell is the expert. We'll hand this to Tignell and his team at the public health agency. We, as we as a Social Democrats and the, and the, and the government as, as a whole, we won't get that involved in this pandemic. We let the agency sort this out. What Tignell and his colleagues also did is basically decided to have less interventions and providing more advice and information to the citizens. So they said basically, please physical distance, be, you know, two meters away from each other, no handshaking, no hugging, et cetera. Which by the way, is not that difficult if you're a Swedish. For example, when I was in Sweden for six months, aside from my wife and daughters who came in August, I didn't touch a single human being. But you know what, that's normal. It's not like France. In France, you hug everybody, right? But in Sweden, you don't. You have, you, you have physical distancing is already in place, you know, de facto. If you will. So, and, and he also, Tignell also really focused on decisions should, based on should, not be, should not be based on politics or gut reactions. We're following the science very carefully. And in one press conference in March, he, he basically, the, he was quoted, the overall goal with the government's work is to reduce the rate of infections. That is to say, push down the infection curve so not too many people become ill at the same time, which by the way, was a similar goal to many other European countries, including the UK. So three possible strategies. So basically in an email that was leaked to the press via Freedom of Information Act Sweden between Anders Tignell and one of his predecessors, a former chief epidemiologist of Sweden, Piet Tull, Piet Tull emailed Tignell and said, you know what, you have three strategies to take now. A, total lockdown of society for a minimum of four weeks. B, test and trace as many people as possible, break the infection chain, it, it changes and put the infected individuals in two week quarantine. And three, let the infection spread slowly or quickly to reach a hypothetical herd immunity. 
And, and in, a, in a very blunt reply, Tignell said, we've gone through all these options and we have decided to go with option three. Tignell was saying basically, we want to go for the herd immunity option. We'll let the virus rip through Sweden, but still basically be careful, you know, physical distance and the like. Many Swedish academics and the editor of Douglas Nyheter, which is the biggest newspaper in Sweden, sort of the equivalent of what, help me now, Frankfurt Allgemeine in Germany or Süddeutsche Zeitung, the biggest paper, respected paper in, in, in Sweden, were very critical on the strategy that Tignell embarked on. They don't understand why is he going for this herd immunity. Then, of course, we had the Ferguson model. Yeah. The Ferguson model. So Ferguson, professor at Imperial College London, known as Professor Lockdown. Ferguson, calc Ferguson calculated based on an epidemiological model were presented in London on the 16th of March, one week before UK lockdown, and received huge amounts of attention. It was noted that UK could reach 510,000 deaths if no interventions were put in place. And now politicians and academics listen. Prior to basically the Ferguson doing this epidemiological model, what was happening in the UK that basically Ferguson and the chief scientist, so, so the prime minister and the chief scientist, Patrick Balanz, and as well as the chief, as chief medical officer, Chris Whitty, were arguing that the UK would also go through so-called herd immunity. That was the goal. But after the Ferguson model was published and discussed infinitum in the UK, as well as in the United States, is that Boris Johnson, the prime minister in the UK, changed his mind and said, basically, we need to basically get a grip of this and do some kind of basically lockdown. In Sweden, Tignell did not react the same way as Boris Johnson did. He's then, he, rather, he asked another predecessor of his, Dr. Johan Giesecke, who had hired Tignell some 30 years prior, to dissect the Ferguson model. Giesecke was, to his nature, very skeptical of Ferguson. Giesecke knew Ferguson from, from past interactions. And he thought, you know, this guy Ferguson, you know, what does he know? He's, for example, Giesecke was trawling up data. For example, Ferguson said that 50,000 people would die from uh, BSC, so variant, uh, so mad cow disease in the UK. 50,000 people, Ferguson said. Actual fact, 177 people died, not 50,000. Ferguson said in 2005, when we had bird flu, and the Imperial Mollison and noted that 150 million people globally would die of bird flu. Actual number was 455. In 2009, we had swine flu, H1N1, as we remember. And, then, and here again, Ferguson and his team noted that 65,000 Brits would die. Actual number was 474. So based on Ferguson's track record, Giesecke was very skeptical. But he did not embrace the Ferguson numbers. And Giesecke didn't have much time for basically Ferguson's latest model. The model was based on a set of predictions and not facts. And Giesecke said, this is much a social science. It's not natural science. This is not physics. And what's quoted in the press, quote, witches and magicians, they have always had high positions in all societies. Giesecke was calling, calling Ferguson a magician. Then at the same time, in a, in a, in a much discussed paper by, by Thomas Puyo, who is an engineer and an MBA from Stanford based in Silicon Valley working for Course Hero, digital, a digital education platform, wrote the paper called Hammer and the Dance. He advocated for strict lockdown, and then to do the R dance, so get, dance to get R below one. That text was read more than 40 million people worldwide. There are a lot of attention in Europe, a lot of attention in Scandinavia, a lot of attention in Sweden. Tignell was asked to comment it. And he basically looked at the paper from, from our friend Puyo, not a, not a medical scientist at all, didn't have any kind of understanding of public health. And he said the text was soft. 18th of March, 2020, Belgium goes into full lockdown. What does Sweden do? Sweden basically uh, asked Giesecke and, and a few other professors, Albert Britton and von Schrieb, all from, from Karliske student Stockholm, to dissect the Ferguson model in much more detail. Take note, so we're not gonna go crazy. We're not locking down Sweden. Let's dissect the Ferguson model in more detail. Let's go through this in detail, line by line, page by page, to see if the Ferguson model actually makes sense. 
do we actually have to have a lockdown in Sweden? So Sweden stays open, no close. Schools stayed open and, and had done so for the entire pandemic. And my friends, even now in the fourth wave, Swedish, school, Swedish schools are still open. Restaurants and gyms stayed open. The border remains open for Swedish citizens. That's how I got into Sweden in March, 2020, leaving London. No face masks anywhere, as Tignell did not like them, and he was not convinced that they offered any meaningful protection. Tignell thought basically, he, he, he found them very uncomfortable. And he also said basically people wearing face masks, they put them on their face, but they, they start scratching their face. It kind of defeats the purpose, he said. It was the point of having face masks. Much better to physically distance them by two meters. And Tignell and his then boss, Johan Carlson, and our friend Johan Giesecke, are fairly relaxed about the pandemic and to continue working as per usual. That means Tignell and Johan Carlson, Johan Carlson and Giesecke all commute from their respective houses into central Stockholm, into the agency. So they go on public transport. Carlson comes in from Uppsala, our north of Stockholm. Uh, Tignell comes from Linköping, which is two hours south of Stockholm. And Giesecke comes from Syria, 10 here, 45 minutes. And Giesecke even basically goes and sees his grandkids. Giesecke is over the 70 plus, the same group that's supposed to be self-isolating and shielding, right? He goes and says on television, I'm still seeing my grandchildren. Although by, when actual fact, the agency should not be doing that. And this is all despite a ton of pressure on Tegnell, Carlson and Giesecke from, from, from the neighboring agencies in Norway, Finland, Denmark, as well as the media as a whole. For example, the New York Times say basically, you know, Sweden is now developing, you know, deaf culture. Guardian is very critical and Focus Germany also very critical on a Swedish open approach. Why isn't Sweden locking down? On the 14th of April, an opinion editorial in the Dagens Nyheter, this paper I told you about this most well-respected paper in Sweden, is penned by 22 academics demanding the government, the Swedish government, needs to do something as the public health agency has failed and lost control. It's the most read op-ed in Douglas Nyheter history. It's basically it's hundreds of thousands of times have been downloaded. Tignell, being a very calm and cut individual, questions the numbers used in the op-ed and said, the numbers you're using are not true. The 22 academics, then in the following, in, 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 in rebuttal the next day, admit that they used the wrong numbers in the op-ed, but they say it doesn't matter as the politicians still need to do something. What happens then is these, these poor folks, these 22, if you will, are start being laughed at. And academics, and most notably, the very well-respected journalist, Alex Schulman, criticizes the 22 and notes, quote, it's great that these 22 researchers are not in charge of the country's COVID strategy, end of quote, because they basically overstep the mark. They should be much more careful in terms of the numbers that they were using. On the 16th of April, Giesecke gives an interview about Sweden's COVID strategy for the website Unheard. This, this, this interview is done in English. If you're interested, please just Google Giesecke Unheard April 2020 if you get it. <clears throat> the one hour long interview in which Giesecke was open and honest about Sweden's strategy, including mentioning attempt to reach herd immunity. This interview goes viral and has so far been watched by 1.5 million people. Giesecke becomes like the foreign minister of Sweden and gives up to eight, uh, eight talks a day on Sweden's unique open COVID strategy. And Sweden gets very significant coverage, international media, some of which is very critical, for example, the New York Times and others just mentioned previously. So to take now and Giesecke assumptions in spring 2020, it, they thought, A, it would take several years to get a functioning vaccine. And in actuality, it may be impossible. They think, they think it would take a long time. They, didn't, they thought it would take much longer than a year. And by, a, by, by the way, a view is also shared by the CEO of AstraZeneca. B, there was no point to test and trace as there were too many cases. Better to emphasize physical distancing and good hygiene. So they argued, for example, why count the number of trees dead when the whole forest is on fire? C, the weakest individuals would be the ones who would perish first, and they needed looking after. Ensure that 70 plus is shielded and ban people from visiting the relatives in all people's homes. They said, Yes, there will be, quote unquote, some harvesting among the people who are old and weak. And D, that the herd immunity would come soon to Sweden 
there was a possibility that Stockholm would have 40% with population infected by May 2020. Did Sweden's strategy initially work? Sweden, yes, Sweden had higher levels of COVID infections and deaths than the other Scandinavian countries combined, much higher than Denmark, Norway, and Finland combined. Hey. COVID-19 entered the old people's homes, and of all the fatalities, 70% took place in old people's homes. One reason for this was the lack of proper care home staff, or as Erik Stockner, the Christian Democrat in charge of care homes in Greater Stockholm noted, where you had a ton of people getting infected and dying in these homes, quote, we had too many in hourly wages, so not permanent staff, a number had too low of Swedish language knowledge, so, so not from Sweden. The levels of education was too poor, and there were too few who were actually trained as nurses. Pretty damning indictment. Sweden suffered from acute lack of COVID test kits, and as a result, could not test all the individuals who asked for tests in the spring, unlike, for example, Finland, the Tana kit, kit, by the way. There's also lack of PP, personal protection equipment. And some attendants, both in old people's homes, as well as who aided old people at home, did not have any proper equipment, which spread COVID even faster. They made their own equipment up out of basically all, you know, rubbish sacks and the like. Didn't have the, they couldn't get the equipment enough. And there's a chronic shortage of home care assistance. And as a result, these assistants were in high demand with many homes at once, spreading COVID even more. So, everyone's in Germany, <clears throat> but in Sweden, if you're old and frail, you A, you go to an old people's home, and you'll to know people's home, or B, you stay put in your house, and then somebody comes by once or twice a day and dresses you and feeds you. And these people coming by once or twice a day, because there were so few of them, they were seeing more and more old people. And as a result, as they, they, they themselves sometimes had COVID, they were spreading COVID quicker to these old people as well in that way. Yet, Sweden had considerably higher freedom of levels of freedom than any other country in Europe. Swedish children were able to go to school and more or less have a normal life. And as a result, they had much less mental health issues than in many other kids in other parts of Europe. The economic costs per capita were considerably less than most other European nations. And over time, thanks in part to the successful vaccine rollout strategy, the levels of COVID infections and deaths have decreased markedly. Could Sweden's open strategy have worked in Germany? It's a question for you, something we can discuss in the Q&A afterwards. Or was basically Sweden doing a, a huge experiment? Sweden kept its high level of freedom throughout the summer. During this time, Tignell made a number of announcements. The cases had come down in part because Sweden had achieved some form of herd immunity. However, in October 2020, COVID cases started to increase. This is now started wave two. And again, hitting places that had already been hit once with wave one, so Stockholm, and also places that had not been hit at all, such as Malmö in southern Sweden. At this stage, the prime minister puts Tignell aside and they gives taking charge of the crisis. He realizes like, we, we can't afford this. We've got to do something more, more radical. And he, he, he introduces a series of measures, including the rule of eight, eight people gathering at the same time, making that to rule of four, only four people come together at the same time, closing restaurants and bars at 10 p.m., and ensuring that the long distance buses and trains can, can only be half full at any time. But still, there's no closure. So why did Tignell not close down Sweden? There are several reasons. A, he didn't believe in the Tick Ferguson model. B, he didn't buy the whole hammer and the dance thing. He thought the herd immunity was the way to go. Also, according to Under by this author I mentioned initially, also because he had overrated the past. With the Mexican swine flu outbreak in the spring 2009, which WHO classified as a pandemic, in Sweden, unlike many other European countries, we decided to order 18 million doses of GSK pandemics vaccine. In October that year, the Swedish vaccine rollout began and 5.3 million Swedes got vaccinated, the highest in the world percentage-wise. But the problem with this pandemic had a side effect. This vaccine had a side effect, narcolepsy. 400 cases of narcolepsy, people had difficulty sleeping within one year. And then calculations done three years afterwards showing that this vaccine rollout of, of pandemics only saved six lives in total. So the, the, the rumor is, or this hypothesis, if you will, that Tignell was much more careful now with COVID-19 
because he thought, I can't prove this, I haven't spoken about it, but he, because he overreacted in the past. So final numbers. Today, this is not last week, 15,057 Swedes have died in, in Sweden, and there have been one, over one, almost 1 1.2 million confirmed cases. That's quite much more than that, by the way. We didn't have, to, we didn't have any test and trace kit initially. Early 2021, 20, 83 confirmed cases per 100K, so much less right now than in Germany. Sweden, you have one, almost 1,500 dead per million. UK, you had, we had three lockdowns. You had 2,100 dead per million. Germany has done better than Sweden slightly, and Denmark has done much, done much better. So in conclusion, for the whole 2020, in terms of excess mortality, according to Eurostat, Sweden ended up in the 21st place out of 31 countries. Countries that had lockdowns, including France, Hungary, Poland, Portugal, Belgium, Czech Republic, Spain, and the UK had more deaths caused by COVID. And Sweden, my friends, stayed open. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ragnar. That's really great. Thanks for this. Um, You're welcome. Especially actually, Sweden. I'd like to start out with one question, if I may. Please do. Taking full advantage of my prerogative as moderator of this session. So you actually painted quite a bleak picture. So in the first half of the presentation, uh, a lot was about scientific turf wars between factions uh, the, that sort of, you know, um, some, some models weren't believed in because there weren't, um, there was no buy-in from another scientific community yep. and so on and so forth. So um, I'm wondering, about the um, societal response, the the, the public, um, as you said, the the public, you know, they the younger people, they they were fairly well off during the the pandemic. And schools are open, um, bars were open, restaurant life, and so on could go on as normal. So, what did sort of what's the public response to all of this? Because Sweden clearly was a bit of an outlier with regards to um, COVID nineteen measures. It's a great question. So, basically, overall, the Swedish public trusted Tignell. Tignell said basically, please physical distance. You know, don't do any handshakes. You know, try to you know avoid public gatherings. Try to avoid avoid meeting too many people. Work from home if you can, and overall. People followed that. And the figures show in Sweden, either high level of public trust for Tignal himself, and also high level of public trust for the Swedish Public Health Agency. So much so, Pia, that in the summer of 2020, you had basically Swedes going and getting tattooed for a picture of Anders Tignal. They thought, they thought Tignal was a hero. So they really basically decided to go over the top in a way and say, I trust Tignal. And is, is it, and is it not great that Sweden stayed open? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Jose, your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, Professor, thank you for your uh, presentation. It's the first time that I see somebody, you're an insider, of course, we remember the 2009 pandemic and the effect of pandemics. In that time, I had three young kids and I know what I went through with uh, by signing and not fascinating with the pandemics uh, vaccine. Luckily, my doctor, family doctor, following the experience of Germany. There were at the time two drugs in Germany, one with drops for the elites and the vaccine pandemic for the people. And my daughter learned that. And so we, I managed to buy uh, in Spain drops for the kids with no side effects. So it was a result of the European policy of buying only the monopoly of the GlaxoSmithKline vaccine. Uh, but I have, um, uh, not a question, <laughs> a comment is, is that uh, in Portugal, we had a revolution in 74, as you know, and we had with this pandemic, 56 states of emergency uh, reenacted re every 15 days. Uh, so uh, in the, this was possible because there is no European uh, health policy that is, is go in your opinion, as an expert, is something going to change in the future so the Europeans come together in health terms? Because 
I don't want to monopolize, but let me say that I am an advisor over the Portuguese safety agency for food, food safety agency. And since December, we were uh, gathering data from China to, do, uh, to give recommendations to the Chinese restaurants in Portugal. The embassy had alerted about this virus in December, 2019. And I know that for food safety, Portugal follows religiously the European Food and Safety Agency. In this case, there is no, bar, no agency to follow. So uh, the Portuguese agency do whatever it comes to their minds uh, regarding vaccination and all that. So there will be a change or in the health field, this is not possible, Professor. Great question. And I mean, what to tell you the truth, Jose, I'm totally worried about this. Let's just, I mean, I'm work, now working on my paper five on COVID-19. I love this, and I'm getting more and more papers on COVID-19. Looking at how the European various countries handled the, the AstraZeneca vaccine, okay? So what happened initially is Sweden decided we cannot have anybody over the age of 65 to get the AZ vaccine because we don't have enough data about it, uh, on it, okay? Fine, so only the youngsters get it. Then as you know, Jose, is that the youngsters are getting side effects from AstraZeneca vaccine. And I should clarify, by the way, both my jabs were AstraZeneca. So then Sweden changed their strategy and, said, and changed their mind saying only the people over the age of 65 should get AZ, everybody else should get Pfizer or Moderna. And at the same time, in, in the other nations, there are different strategies. For, I mean, for example, in, in the UK, only the people over the age of 30 should get AstraZeneca vaccine, but no one under the age of 30. In Germany, uh, Hakeem, help me here. In Germany, AZ vaccine was allowed for whom? Well, I think if I remember correctly, and my fellow Germans can also correct me, it also changed actually in between when, for example, the first uh, side effects came up and it changed it only this type of people or this gender only in this age category. So it was uh, also changing communications over time, let's say it this way. Yes, thank you, Hakeem. So it caused massive confusion. And I've, I have been telling your folks at European Medicine Agency, and I've been telling your folks in UK Medicine, I've been telling Tignell's colleagues in Sweden, wouldn't it be nice to have a, you know, a, a, a strategy, a European wide strategy on who should take the AZ vaccine and who should not take the AZ, AZ vaccine? And they all say yes, yet it's still not happening. But I think Jose, that's your question. This has to be looked at at much more detail so we don't have any more confusion in the next pandemic. It's absolutely vital to get this right. So P is saying, oh, people younger than 30 only get Pfizer. So it's similar to Sweden, similar to UK. Thank you. Yeah, but that just came out last week, okay. that recommendation. But it's still confusion out there, completely. A mess. Thank you. Anyone else? So a question I have for you then, if, they, if don't catch me, could Sweden's open uh, society with Sweden's schools not closing, could that have worked in Germany or would that have been impossible? Anyone? Akeem, go ahead. Well, you mean actually if uh, Germany could have done the same more or less strategy than Sweden has done, right? Correct. The question. Um, I don't think so, because the difference is that Sweden is, as I found, understand a unitary state, which is relatively small with short borders, actually. And as you mentioned, physical distancing is something which comes natural to yeah. Swedish people. While Germany, you have 16 states, you have lots of cross-border travel, and you have also very different types of cultures. I mean, for example, in the West and the South, things like Carnival with tens of thousands of people, um, celebrating in the streets and hugging each other and so on, even outside of Carnival is something rather common. So I'm unsure if that policy could really have been implemented. And it was very long time that in Germany that the 16 states more or less did their thing until then the federal parliament at some point, I think it was around four last year actually decided and the federal government actually now to implement national policies, which is a so-called um, uh, um, the epidemic situation of national proportions. I think this is roughly the translation actually of the law. And since then, actually, it became more, um, let's say, coherent policies. But the, for example, the, 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 um, the rates you've mentioned us on, it's now 83 in the early, you know, and 83 per 100,000 person in 
uh, early November in Sweden, in Germany, it totally varies. You have areas with about 800 in the south, and then you have areas with less than 10. So this is also how policies are differently implemented on the national level, on the state level, and even on the communal level, actually. Yeah. Wow, such big differences. I had no idea. It's massive. Thank you. Anyone else? Pia, and then Ilan. No, Ilan goes first. Ilan. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thanks, Ragnar. Um, I just am wondering yeah. in the way that it was set yeah, up, what I'm looking for. Um, that it was very much yeah. focused yeah. around the um, the tech. I mean, the the medical or epidemiological issues. And in the US, um, it really was such a battle between the economic and political and the medical. So that the, the economic yeah. in many places completely yeah, and the political the completely US. overruled. Um, Fauci notwithstanding, um, perhaps even to some degree accentuated by that because of a sense of allegiance somehow. And I don't hear that that was the situation in, in Sweden and, and perhaps also not so much in other parts of Europe, though I think more so in the East, in East Europe. What's your take on that? So, so thank you, Lan. So basically in Sweden is the prime minister. He was, you can say he was a hesitant prime minister. Stefan Levian did not even want to become a prime minister when he initially was asked to become one. He only did so to, to help the Social Democratic Party, which had been a member of his entire life. So he was a hesitant prime minister, not one of these bubbly, populistic Boris Johnsons of the UK, if you will. He doesn't like public speaking at all, but he only did it as a, basically as a favor back to the country in Sweden. So when this pandemic came out along, he, he didn't feel comfortable talking about it. He's not a medical doctor, he's not an epidemiologist. He didn't understand the science behind it. So he very conveniently handed the whole Pan pandemic ball to the chief epidemiologist Anders Tignell and said, Anders Tignell, you run with this. You tell us what we should be doing. We, I want you to have daily press conferences from now on, basically, uh, from in mid-March to basically tell the population of Sweden what's happening and what we are going to do about it. It's in your control. So the prime minister of Sweden gives the power and authority from him to Anders Tignell, the architect of the Swedish strategy, and he's in charge of the thing. And he then comes, he just brings along a bunch of professors to discuss the Ferguson model, to discuss what should be doing, what should be doing now. He doesn't want to overreact, probably because of 2009 swine flu, I think, in part. And he wants to come across as being sensible. And the Swedish public really buy into this. And, and, if you, and, he's, and if you can see the Gisek interview in April, Gisek says in April 2020, is that the European nations all look pretty similar in that, where you have lockdowns or no lockdowns because this stuff will spread. We just tried to follow the science in Sweden. And I think that is what happened. I cannot comment on how it was in the United States, Elan, but yeah, I'm sure it was much more political there than it was in Sweden. And Sweden was not political at all at the initial first wave. I, I, part of the reason for my question to, and sort of reflections on it is that I think so much of this hinges on the rate or, or the, the um, timing of when people actually be began to take this seriously and then to factor in the social dimensions of this and the way people react to it. And I think um, certainly in the US, that played a big role in greatly accelerating the rate of infection. There was no coherent strategy. I mean, that was one, one aspect, but there was actually a very specific feedback, negative feedback loop that was in action from very early on, thanks to Trump and others, but um, it was not only Trump, but uh, locally as well, I mean, state level as well. Yeah. And we didn't have that in Sweden at all. It's basically when Tignal said, please physical distance, stay away from two meters from each other. Don't have too many social gatherings, especially don't have any in-house parties. Don't party too much. 
just be careful. The Swedes really basically listened to that. I remember being in Sweden over Easter 2020, still working in my trees, and uh, Tignell requested data from Telia, the Swedish mobile phone company, to find out mm -hmm. are the Swedes traveling over Easter? And while Tignell said to the Swedish public on Good Friday, please do not travel over Easter. Please be sensible. Please stay put. The concern Tignell had was basically if you go in from your main residence, say from Stockholm or Gothenburg, and moving to your country house, most Swedes have a summer house, you're going from an area of high level of infection to an area, say, of Gotland, an island in the, in the Baltic Sea, of very low levels of infection. You'll basically then come there with COVID, infect the locals, and the hospital in Visby, Gotland will be overwhelmed. Please, please do not travel. April 2020, during that Easter break, 93% of the population in Sweden listened to Tignell and stayed put in Stockholm, stayed put in Gothenburg, they did not travel to their summer residence. They believed in Tignell's message. And Tignell then after Easter said, thank you for taking my message on board. I really appreciate that. You help, you, you're not helping to hinder the spread of this infection. And it, so it went, went both ways. Tignell asked the people to do something and the people listen. You didn't have that, you know, as you say in the States, you various governors and so on and so forth telling you, know, not listening to the evidence at all. In Sweden, that was not the case in the first way. They tried to follow as much as possible what Tignell had to say. Thanks. You're welcome. Anyone else? Yeah, so um, final question for me, because I need to leave. I'm sorry, I have to teach a course at uh, Potsdam University. So the thing is, um, from a governance perspective, from a risk manager's perspective, um, the Swedish case sounds like a success story. You know, people have trust in science. The scientists, they uh, pour over those models and pick them apart as scientists usually want to do, you know, yep. to try to find out some, some faults or improve the models. So actually, uh, this sounds like um, the pure evidence-based risk governance approach. So it, that the, the, the Swedish case in that, in that sense should actually, as, or, you know, reflects very well that what is being regarded as the, the optimal approach. So the, the question would be, um, going back to your uh, final, final remark, whether this approach would work in other countries as well. And I totally on board with Achim's remarks that the German um, context is quite different. Um, there is, I suppose, less trust in um, the government, less trust in agencies and in science institutions. And there's also greater, much greater heterogeneity. And then Elan brought also up the case of the US uh, where policy making as such uh, works along different ways and follows different rationale. Um, so I suppose uh, in, in other countries that might also be the case. I agree with you. I don't think that the Swedish model would have worked in the UK, for example. London is much more close-knit, much more huggy, kissy, kissy kind of society. People getting together all the time. And I don't see, I mean, the UK had to have some form of lockdown. Otherwise, the NHS in the UK would have been overwhelmed. I fully agree with you. I think Sweden is an outlier here. I think the Swedish model could have been adopted, say, in Norway and also in Finland, but not in Germany or not in the UK. Akim, your question? You're still muted, Akim. I can't hear you. As usual, sorry. Um, a question back to um, regard Sweden. Um, I remember where we were that bit last year, stylized by the media, also things like Team Drosten. Drosten is one important uh, researcher in Germany, and Team Streeck, who has different opinion than Drosten, actually. And the media, whether it be in talk shows or in newspapers, try to create a sort where it's a dissent or not a consensus within science, actually. And so there is not that clear, let's say, trust in this regard with, 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 as it was likely in Sweden. I was just wondering actually, if there was also something like that, that, that people started to, let's say, grouping 
and almost like let's say a show fight or so and see how scientists argue with each other and so on. Thank you, Akim. So yes, we had that. So we had we had Team Tignell, who were basically the leaders of the Swedish Open, Open Society, if you will. Then you had a group of 22 academics from Umeå, Stockholm, Uppsala, and elsewhere, who were very critical of the Tignell model and argued basically in, in, in this opinion editorial on April 2020 that Sweden must close down. But what happened here was is that they the folks, the 22, if you will, they got their numbers wrong in the initial op-ed. And Tignell was very easy for him. He just called about on it. So he said, you know, these numbers are not true. You guys got the wrong numbers. And then with the 22 coming back and saying, in the Douglas D hit, they're saying, well, it doesn't matter. You still have to do something. Then they had, then they lost the they lost the debate. That the, the folks at 22 lost the debate to Tignell at all. And furthermore, actually, Tignell's basically halo was enlarged and, his, and, and the trust for Tignell and the public health agency increased over time. So by having these folks criticizing Tignell, with Tignell then coming back and saying your numbers are wrong and they're admitting the numbers are wrong, that basically enhanced the trust in Tignell completely. And the same thing is that you had one guy, Professor Umio, in also in now in March 2020, taking the Ferguson model and applying it to Sweden and saying basically by the summertime we'll have 50,000 dead Swedes because of you know not doing anything. And Tignell then coming on television and quoting his small trio of professors, if you will, and saying, We have gone through the Ferguson model. We think that the model is pretty soft. And if and we're virtually certain we not have 60,000 people dead in Sweden by summer 2020. We have a few thousand people dead, yes, but not 60,000. And once again, people believed what Tignell had to say. And also Tignell is very non-emotional in the way he speaks. He's very like, he's a bit dry, but he comes across as somebody who's very trustworthy and he's following the science and people buy into that. And the scientists who try to, try to attack Tignell in Sweden a majority of them lost that battle. And therefore in Sweden, now, the, even now in the fourth wave, if you will, people are very careful in criticizing Tignell openly. Yes, privately, but not openly. Yeah, I think an advantage of Tegnell is that he is actually a governmental official and the trust in government in Sweden is relatively strong with yep. health. And that, um, as I said, this group of 22 has actually made a mistake, a critical mistake in the initial communication. And that is different to Germany, actually. I mean, first of all, we do have the so-called Robert Koch Institute, but it is just one agency uh, on the federal level which does not have the same, as I gather from your presentation, uh, let's say influence or authority as Tegnell and his agency has, actually. And then you have groups of scientists. And then, of course, you have uh, um, 16 states. And then one government could say, well, in our case, it seems to be more like this scientist is right. And the other government, state government says, well, it is more like this side and so on, actually. So of course, also we have pick and choose actually in this regard. So I think really that it is in, 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 in Sweden, it is such, such a straight line, actually. I think this is really a great difference. And also in terms of the communication actually goes around because for example, people in Northern Germany or Northern Germany general had lower infection rates in Southern Germany on average about. And of course they in the North said, well, hey, why should not, uh, why we should have the same restrictions as the Southern Germans. But on the other hand, the Southern Germans partly even travel to Northern Germany because there's lockdown at home, but not in the North. So let's go to the North actually. So also these types of problems. And I mean, we've talked about this Ragnar, uh, the rules for masks and public transport are different than in Berlin, than in Brandenburg. If I walk down the street two kilometers, I have to wear a different mask actually than I have to in Potsdam, so you know. So these types of communication issues also plays into it. Absolutely. But the impression in Germany is much more fragmented than you have in Sweden, for example. In Sweden, it's much more of a top-down process where you trusted Tignell and his colleagues, and that was it. Well, in Germany, you have basically a bunch of individuals, a bunch of agencies competing for the same media space. So fundamentally very different in Germany, I'd say. That's the impression I get. Okay. Um, Pia asked me to take over as she had to leave because of her class. So now we still have a few minutes left. Does anyone else would like to chime in or provide any comments, questions, or experiences? And I have a question for uh, Jose. You, are you in Portugal now, Jose? No, no, no. I'm here in uh, Potsdam. Okay, so okay, can you <laughs> can you just enlighten us? 
Why are the levels of vaccination so high yes. in Portugal? What have you done right? While we, for example, no, no, no. in the UK and Germany have not done right. It's history. The old people, normally 80% over 60, take the flu vaccine. And for the young people, the youngsters, that's called, um, I don't know in English the name, for the youngsters, the vaccine for mainly young women. The HPV's jab. Yes, it's 85%. Right. In, in, so there is no anti-vaccination movement in Portugal. And there is this tradition of getting everybody vaccinated. So these rates that we have now with COVID, 87%, it's like the same for flu or for the, the youngsters vaccine. Uh, there wow. is no, it's different from Spain and Italy where the 30%, as you know, there is a, move, a strong movement against vaccines. Right, wow, thank you for the explanation, I didn't know. Uh, thank you, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you. All right, anyone else? Or it's time to go and have a cup of coffee? Apparently, okay. coffee. Okay, it's time for coffee. Then I want to say thank you very much for listening to this talk. And like I said, if you want to hear more about Sweden and you can't find my papers, just let me know, drop me an email. And otherwise, I'm here at the Institute. I'm basically living in a flat. At, at, at my, my building, Akim, is the von Kleist building, right? Uh, yeah, the Kleist Villa, as it's called. Kleist Villa. So if you have any questions, you want to come by and see me, just, you know, just drop me a note. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.